All right. If I were you, I'd have a Bible, and I would turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. We'll get there in a couple of minutes. It's always good to see you folks, whether you're here in person or joining us online. I look forward to these moments of connection and instruction and teaching. I love this opportunity to serve you by sharing the word. I want to begin a little bit differently this morning, and this is a bit of a game that we've played in years past, and it's a very simple exercise in some regards, but give the pastor the best of your attention. I'm going to say a word, and by the raising of your hand, we're going to keep this a bit orderly. orderly. I would like you to try to offer definition. Now, if you want to go on dictionary.com, that's totally fine if you want to be that guy. But try to take a stab at it. I'm going to offer a word. Offer me a definition. Number one, everybody's favorite word. Are you ready? Taxes. T-A-X-E-S. Give the pastor a workable definition and speak loudly so we can hear you on the camera and on the recording. What are taxes? If you were to give me a simple and summary definition. I see a hand. Byron. Okay. Paid to whom? Paid to what party? The government. Taxes by definition is a sum of money, I like this definition literally, demanded by the government for its support or for specific services levied upon incomes, property, and sales. Let's try another one. Give me a workable definition for the word vacation. Two very different words, by the way. Fun. Yeah, you think fun, entertainment. What else? What do we think? How would you define the word vacation? Peggy, I see your hand. Beautiful. It's a period, a period where work or study is temporarily suspended, typically for rest, recreation, or travel. Fun. One more word. Let's try this. Ooh, that's a dangerous one. I'll skip that one. I'll do it. You ready? Politician. Be nice, because we're told to pray for such leaders. We Christians are going to maintain a good heart toward our leaders. But give me a workable, appropriate definition. And as a reminder, you are being recorded. Very good. That's, a, that's almost a perfect definition. A person who holds a political office, one who administrates, governs, or represents a group of people in a specified geographical area. Now, I want to give you one more word, and this is going to be the, the opening volley, if you will, of today's message and what's to come. Are you ready? If you want to write this down, you can. Provide the pastor a workable, suitable definition for the word love. L-O-V-E. What is love? Peggy, I love the energy. Go ahead. Okay. It's an emotion that you, emotion that you feel towards someone that you care deeply about. Byron? The idea of sacrifice, commitment. Very good. Anything else? Compassion. Excellent. Patty, I see wheels are turning and a hand raised. Doing the highest good for another. Excellent. Those are all actually very excellent uh, examples and answers of what love means. But here's the problem that we run into with the word love. Are you ready? And I've done this before, but here we go. I love my dog. How many folks have met Lucy? She's a sweetheart. She's a little back burner since getting the baby. Well, we're really trying to show her some love. I love hot dogs. Very, very different. I love movies. Are there any Marvel fans out there? You're out there. Are there any Patriots fans? Hefe, are you wearing a Red Sox shirt today? How was that 18-inning game, by the way? Did they win that one? I missed it. No, I'm sorry. But Hefe loves sports. I love my mom. Hi, Mom, in the far back. I love my friends. I love my wife. I love my child. I love Jesus. Do you kind of see the inherent problem with, that we run into with this one word? It's that we use the word love as an umbrella term that is used to capture a wide array of meanings. Because, because the kind of love that I have for my wife is different than the kind that I have for my mom, and different than the kind that I have for pizza, or for Marvel films, though Marvel films are fantastic. We base the interpretation of this word upon the context in which we use it. But the amazing thing is if you look at the language of the ancients, ancient Greeks specifically today, they didn't just have one word for love. They had multiple words that each conveyed a different specific 
definition. And I want to just quickly run through these very, very, very briefly. The first word is a word that never actually appears in the Bible, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Eros, E-R-O-S. Does that word sound like any English word that you can think of? Eros, E-R-O-S. Help the pastor out. Everyone's afraid to say it. The word erotic, okay? Very good. I know it's a bad word, but we're going to say it. This ancient term from which we derive the term erotic never appears in the pages of the Bible, but it has to do with a romantic kind of love. And this kind of love is vital for a few reasons. One is it helps to uh, propagate our race, our species, if you will. It helps to bring couples together, and it's a key component in a healthy marriage. Marriage is awfully tough if you don't have a romantic interest in the partner that you are with. Of course, and here's kind of the downside of it, eros is a very conditional type of love, which means that very often it's based on the loveliness, the beauty, or the attractiveness of the other person. It's easy to feel eros towards someone who is beautiful, not so much if they're Quasimodo. So there's limits to this thing called eros. The second word, moving very quickly, is storge. This word does appear in the New Testament, and it refers to a familial love. It's the natural affection that you feel toward a parent or toward a child or toward a sibling or even maybe to an uncle or to an aunt, etc. This is a vital type of love is it really helps to bond the family unit. But that's kind of the inherent limitation of it. Stuarge as a, as a sense of commitment or sacrifice or an emotion of affection is normally very potent toward just a few people, but it doesn't extend well beyond that. By the raising of a hand, if you were a parent, how many of you would be willing to die for your child? See how fast the hands went up? Put your hands down. How many of you would be willing to die for your supervisor? Toward a stranger. You ready? Toward an enemy. Notice how the hands don't shoot up. Storge is potent and profound when, when, the, when, the, when the, based upon the condition of proximity of relationship, but beyond that, it dissipates awfully fast. The third type of love is philia. The word which also appears in the New Testament texts refers to a brotherly love. Ever hear the term Philadelphia? Literally translated, the city of brotherly love. The type of love that is shared among close friendships. Again, this is a vital type of love. It's the kind of love I might feel to a jefe on a certain day, or no, all the time jefe, or to, or to other close friends that I have. But again, there's a bit of a limitation. Because beyond your immediate circle of two, three, or four really, really close friends, this type of love dissipates radically quickly. The fourth kind of love is the kind that I want to focus on this morning. And it's the primary or the dominant word that appears in the New Testament, agape. And the term refers to an unconditional, selfless, and sacrificial affection. This kind of love transcends the bounds of the other three types, and it's the type of love that God has for us, for all of humanity. For God so, help the pastor out, John 3, 16, for God so, for God so unconditionally loved us when we were undeserving that he gave his one and only son. I love Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, translation, while we were his enemies and violators of everything that he holds dear, Christ died for us. You see, God has the kind of love where he loves the unlovable and he loves the unlovely and he loves those who really on their own have no sense of merit where we deserve that kind of love and here's the trick in so many respects this is the kind of love that God calls us as Christians to walk in I want to read a text to you don't turn there but I want you to listen to what the following has to say Jesus was asked one day teacher what's the greatest commandment in the law this should sound familiar Jesus replied, love the Lord your God, how much? 
with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. So we are to love God, are you ready? Unconditionally, sacrificially, selflessly. Has there ever been a time in your Christian experience where the Lord maybe seemed to be dragging his feet in answering a prayer? Like, Lord, I asked you like last weekend for this thing and it still hasn't happened yet. Or, Lord, I asked you last year. Or, Lord, I asked you decades ago. Is our love for him, though, to be conditioned upon such things? The answer is no. Do we love God only when we're having a good day? No. It's bad days, too. So we are called to unconditionally love the Lord. But the second commandment is like it. Jesus said the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So the kind of love that we're called to have for humanity as a whole, including enemies, which hurts, is an unconditional love. A new command I give to you, Jesus said. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. What? If you love one another. If you show me, let's just say, a church that is full of infighting and split and division, you know what I'm showing you or what you're showing me? A church where love is not operating for God or for one another. So by this, one thing, that lost world knows that we're really the real thing. It's a love that we have for each other and, of course, for him. I want to read this verse to you, James 1.27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. And it's a twofold thing. One is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You want to know the essence of what a true faith before God is? It's a twofold thing of personal holiness and separation from that which is evil and a dedication to love even the least of these. In this morning, I want to spend some time looking at an example. And I want to continue this next week as a matter of fact. And I want to look at one of the more famous parables of Jesus Christ found in the New Testament texts. And it's in Luke chapter 10, which is where you already are. And I want to begin at verse 25. And we're going to read the whole thing in its totality. And then we're going to backtrack and kind of begin to pull this thing apart one piece at a time. And again, we're going to continue this next week as well. Luke 10, starting at verse 25, it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to do what? To test Jesus. Teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, this should sound familiar, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, you have answered correctly, Jesus said. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who's my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, and here's where we enter into a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Verse 32, so too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side, but a Samaritan. As he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And Jesus asks the question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus ends this particular section of Luke 10 by saying, go and do likewise. 
I want to go back now to the beginning of this text, and I want to begin to pull it a piece, or pull it apart a piece at a time, because there are some depths to this text that are very, very easy to overlook that are going to help expand the meaning to you in some respects. Verse 25, what we see on one occasion, this teacher asks the Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And we see that the teacher is actually asking a really good question. If you were in the New Testament days and ministry and living at the time that Christ was ministering, this is really a million-dollar question. Lord, what do I have to do to gain life eternal? That is a probing question. It is an important question. It's a significant question, and it's a question that we, in a sense, should all be asking. You know, gang, this life is awfully short. How many of you are over, over 60 years old? Wave a little hand. True or false, it went real fast. It's true. I look on my far left, I see some young people. I love these three or four on the front row. Sweet, sweet kids. Summer breaks seem to go on forever. A school year takes forever to go. As you go, as you get older, weeks go by like this. And then eventually, months go by like this. Gang, I can't believe it's already almost 2019. Where did 2018 go? And I'm only 40. Ken Foley always said, the older you get, the faster it moves. So if we're going to ask anything, it's, Lord, when I check out of this place, how do I make sure I know where I'm going? That's an important question. And if you don't know how to properly answer that, then please give ear to what the Lord is about to say. But the second part of this is the teacher is not asking for a good reason. It says that he asked this question to do what? To test Jesus. To try to trip him up, to get him to say something dumb, whereby he could accuse him and maybe even get him something like stoned or killed, etc. To somehow blaspheme. So he's asking a good question, but he's asking for all of the wrong reasons. But either way, the Lord in his mercy decides to spend some time in reply. And Jesus, in a masterful fashion, turns the question on him. That's a good question, teacher. Why don't you tell me? You're an expert in the law. You teach this stuff for a living. How do you get into heaven? How do you secure eternal life? Look at what he says in verse 26. What's written in the law? What's written in the Bible? How do you read it? Jesus now is probing the man who is trying to probe him in his theology. And the teacher, amazingly, gets the answer right. And look at what he says in verse 27. Love the Lord your God, again, with every fiber of your being, and love yourself. If you want some fun facts here, the teacher is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Leviticus chapter 19. You see, there is some pretty good stuff in the book of Leviticus. This is proof of that. If we can love God and others, then we shall inherit eternal life. And Jesus even commends him on this answer. You have answered correctly, verse 28. Do this and you will live. Now, does anybody see the fundamental problem with this, though? If we can love God and other people, we can be granted eternal life. But how many people in the sound of my voice have perfectly loved God your entire life and have perfectly loved others? Not even close. In this man, this should have been a moment for him to realize, I know what the word says. But if I'm honest, I also know that I have not met that requirement. This should have been a moment for him to recognize a need for a savior. But instead of going to that place, he tries in verse 29 to justify himself. Gang, if we are good at anything as human beings, it is justifying ourselves. We can do it with the best of them. So he asked the Lord a question. Who is my neighbor? In an effort to protect himself or shield himself from the implications of Christ's words. And we see that Jesus now will tell a story in reply to that. And as we read, I want you to wrestle with the question, which of the individuals in the story actually demonstrates not only a love for God, but a love for others? And what kind of love are we looking for? An unconditional, selfless, sacrificial type of love. In verse 30, the Lord provides the setting in which the parable takes place. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from where? From Jerusalem to where? To Jericho. 
Now, we may not know this, but the people of his day would have. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho, fun fact for you, descends approximately 3,000 feet over the span of 17 miles. It was an incredibly dangerous road to travel. It was steep, it was rocky, it was winding, and it was desolate. And it provided many areas for robbers and thieves and beyond to hide as they preyed upon innocent travelers. The moment that Jesus, in telling the story, said a guy was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, the audience would have thought, that's a really dangerous area to be traveling in at all. The story continues. Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Notice that Jesus gives very little information regarding this man. We know his gender, but help the pastor out. Do we know anything about his race or ethnicity? No. Likely Jewish, but that's, that's an inference. We don't know for sure. We know nothing about why he was in Jerusalem in the first place. We know nothing about why he was going to Jericho. Do we know his age? Do we know his economic level? Was he rich? Was he poor? We know precious little about this man, and in every way, he is essentially a nameless, faceless character, really a character who could be anybody, including you and including me. Of course, the Lord introduces now some new characters. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by this first group that we're going to see, robbers. What did they do to the man? They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now again, Jesus is telling this story to underscore the need for love, which is sacrificial, selfless, and unconditional. Are these robbers meant to serve as the illustration for how to do that? Absolutely not. These robbers are the villains of the story in so many regards. There is nothing sacrificial, nothing selfless about them at all. In fact, quite the opposite. They took what belonged to this man. They beat him and they left him for dead, having absolutely no regard for human life. If we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, gang, they are not the examples to emulate. So please don't leave this place saying, i got to be more like them. That is a fast pass to jail. But let's continue on. Because we're going to see here some interesting things unfold. In verse 31 and 32, the Lord is now going to introduce two other parties to the story. What's the first one in verse 31? A what? A priest. Happened to be going down the same road. Now, I want to just kind of think for a moment, if you were in Jesus' initial, original audience, hearing this for the first time, and you heard him mention a priest, would you anticipate the priest is going to be a hero of the story or a villain of the story? A hero. This is a religious leader. This is a person that knows God's word, that teaches God's word, that offers sacrifices. This is somebody in the religious community that we can all aspire to be like. But Jesus, playing on their expectations, flips it and says, when he, the priest, saw the man, what did he do? He passed by on the other side. This would have flipped the script on them. They would never have seen this coming because if anyone's going to be the hero, it will certainly be this priest, but it's not the case. And Jesus doubles down on this with also a Levite, a person who assisted the priests in the operation or the execution of their duties. When he saw the man, what did he do? He also passed by. So what we see is interesting here. People expect robbers and thieves to be kind of evil, but they have a very high bar of expectation among these kinds of people. And the Lord is saying, if you want an example of how to be and what to do in regards to love, the priest and the Levite don't show it. These also are not people that we are supposed to mimic or emulate in every way. But the Lord makes them villains. Maybe they had some good excuses. I want to kind of put myself in the footsteps, if you will, of these priests and Levites. Perhaps they thought to themselves, he's already past the point of help anyway. I'm just going to move along, or it's not safe to be here. Maybe the robbers are still out there. It's not my fault he got himself in the trouble. I have my own issues. I've already had a super long week of ministry serving God. I just want to get home. I'm tired. 
the road is busy and this is a personal favorite that we've all said, I'm sure someone else will help. It's easy to judge these figures as villains, but recognize how often we have displayed the exact same tendencies. In every parable of Jesus, we have the option of mimicking the hero or the villain. And we have to daily decide, moment by moment, decide which of those two we are going to be. Verse 33, we see Jesus and will now introduce the central hero of the account. But a what? A Samaritan. This man's ethnicity adds a lot to the story. The Jewish people, I want you to hear me on this, absolutely despised the Samaritans. There was a long-standing, about 600-plus year hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. These people were scorned because they were of mixed ancestry. And so intense was Jewish hatred for Samaritans that the Pharisees literally prayed that no Samaritan would be raised at the resurrection. How much do you have to hate somebody to pray they literally end up in hell? Think about that. So when Jesus introduced a Samaritan, the audience, would they have thought this man was going to be a hero or a villain? Certainly, if a priest and a Levite failed, this guy is going to fail royally. But Jesus turns it, and it goes a different way. And what we see is that as he traveled, he came to where the man was. And when this Samaritan, this no-good Samaritan saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, and he bandaged his wounds. He poured on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii. Anybody know how much money that is? Does your Bible actually inform you or say? It's about two days' wages. So this isn't like he threw the guy a $5 bill unless you make 17 cents an hour. This is a pretty good chunk of money that he's carrying around, and he gives it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you incur or that you may have. We see in the Samaritan something unconditional in terms of love that is not based on the beauty or the worthiness or the attractiveness of this man in a sense. It's not based on what he can get in return because the man has nothing to offer and he is basically a bloody corpse where there's nothing beautiful. There's something selfless and sacrificial about the man, about this Samaritan. There was a cost to him. There was the potential cost of harm. It was entirely possible robbers were still around. And in taking the time to help this man, it could end up with him being put in a similar condition. It cost him time. Gang, if you're going to serve the Lord in any meaningful capacity, you just have to wrap your, your mind around the fact it's going to cost you some time. Time is a precious commodity. I've said this before and I mean it. I am preaching to the, probably one of the busiest generations in U.S. history. I'm going to add the word self-inflicted busyness, by the way. Because our work may, really isn't the work of survival, it's the work of luxury. You don't work all the hours that you do for food. You do it for two cell phones and two cars and a home that's probably bigger than you actually need and beyond. And I'm guilty of that too. You go to Haiti and you see what it looks like to work for survival. It's a very different animal. But they have time. And so can we if we, prior if we prioritize properly. But it cost him time. What did he forfeit in stopping in taking the time to bandage this man and carry him, to put him on. Ever carry dead weight? Can you imagine the challenge of physically putting this guy up on a donkey and then leading him? It's work. It's time. It's energy. It was no easy task. And most importantly, it cost him cash. How much cash specifically? Two days wages plus. If you're going to be involved in ministry and helping people, it's going to cost you in all of these fronts. How many folks realize that people are kind of messy? Not messy like cluttery, but we all have drama and baggage. And if you're going to get involved in helping to disciple people or reach out to them, 
you're just going to kind of deal with it in the same way that Jesus deals with you. And how many folks love that God doesn't just pull the abort cord and say, you are way too gone for me to help. No, he reaches out, he transforms, he speaks, he calls, he woos. And we are called to be that way as well. The Samaritan identified with the needs of the stranger and had compassion on him. There was no logical reason why he should reorder his plans, invest time and money, etc., to love what is fundamentally an enemy. But this kind of love does not need a reason. It gives by nature. In hearing that a Samaritan did this for a complete stranger while the priest and the Levite walked on ahead would have shocked and humiliated the crowd and the teacher of the law who proudly asked, who is my neighbor? And I want to look at how Jesus finalizes this teaching as we begin to move to a close. Look at how Jesus wraps all of this up. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? This whole account begins with this man asking a question, and it ends with Jesus asking him a question, putting him on the spot. You're a teacher of the law. You're an expert. You're brilliant. You tell me which of the three was a neighbor, which of the three operated in the kind of love that I'm looking for. And the man, tail between his legs a little bit, said the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus ends this wonderful teaching with this. There was no altar call. There was no song. There was no soliloquy or poem. You ready? Go and do the same thing. Go and do Likewise, Jesus indicated that he was called to practice and show this kind of love. And I end with this. By extension, Jesus is calling us to do the same thing. If we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, our love cannot be limited to those who are of the right gender or race or economic level. It cannot be limited by the inherent beauty or the worthiness of the recipient. True love, the kind of love that God calls us to have, is these three things, selfless, sacrificial, and without condition. We have the capacity, as I close, to live like villains or to embrace the virtues put forth by the hero of the story. I end with this. Choose. Go and do likewise. Father, I come before you and I see within myself the tendencies to make it all about me. To love people based upon how much they love me or how good they are to me. Lord, I often predicate the kind of love that I have on so many conditions that it's easy not to love. I pray you'd forgive me and forgive all of us for doing this, God. Because the kind of love that you are calling us to walk in is so much greater than that. Lord, I pray for myself, for this assembly, for each one that is here, upstairs, downstairs, and beyond, that you would cultivate within us the fruit of the spirit of love, whereby we can love people without condition, that we can extend ourselves sacrificially and selflessly to minister to those who are in need. Because that's the essence of pure and faultless religion. Not just holiness, but charity. As we go forth from this place, God, I pray that today you would give us opportunities. Today you'd give us moments where we can show this kind of love. In a healthy way, put us to the test. Put us in the, in the path of people who are unlovely and unlovable and help us to pass that test when it comes. As we go forth from this place, add your favor and your divine blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone says amen.